I'm Kate with New Beginnings Healing Ministry, and you are watching Episode 2 of Fiat, The Resounding Yes That Will Transform Your Life. Today I'm going to talk to you about marrying devotion, and I'm going to also give you my experience or my testimony of Medjugorje. So first of all, devotion. You know, what does that mean to be devoted to someone? It simply means that you love them and that you have um, this loyalty to them. And as Catholics, we, many of us, have a devotion to Our Lady. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, why is Mary so special? God could have just put Jesus on the earth, right? He's God. He can do anything. But he chose to use Mary to bring us Jesus. So why would we not use Mary to get to Jesus and to get to God the Father? Why would we not use the mother that we've been given? And if you think of, you know, Jesus on the cross before he died, you know, when he said, um, you know, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He, he, he never, you know, he did not leave us orphaned. And he, he told us that right then and there. So if you think of a small baby, you know, going through life, it'd be foolish to not call upon the mother and the father. So for us, yes, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but why would we not use the gift that he gave us? You know, the gift of his mother. And she truly is a mother ready at every moment to help us. And over the years, you know, I, I really feel like I can speak for this one because I was nervous to get any closer to Mary than I already was because originally I felt like I was closer to Mary than Jesus. And, you know, I had a great relationship with God and the Holy Spirit and Mary, but I didn't really know Jesus. And I kept trying, you know, different things. I kept trying to read from the Bible and just all this different stuff, yet nothing was really working. I wasn't really having any powerful experiences, which is what we need sometimes for true conversion. And so I trusted, you know, I, when I started, you know, receiving these messages and she kept saying, I'm going to lead you directly to my son. And I, she did just that. I desire the sacraments more. I desire to pray. I desire to just sit in my living room and talk to Jesus. It sounds ridiculous unless you're one of those people that do that. But Mary has never taken me anywhere other than to the foot of the cross. And her fiat has just helped me transform my own life because every time I want to be selfish or I don't want to answer, you know, my, my higher calling, I just, I hear those words in, in my mind and I, I can't help but to repeat them and you know thy will be done and do whatever it is so yes Mary has a very very special place in my heart and in the hearts of many many Catholics and I think for very good reason so I'm going to go ahead now and tell you my my story about Medjugorje so with Medjugorje if you're not familiar with it I will be sure to um, go through and find some really helpful videos that really lay out all of the, you know, the details. Um, but basically, Our Lady has been appearing in Medjugorje for quite some time now. Um, I think it started in 1981, and there's six um, children, they're adults now, but six children in the beginning, they would, would see Mary. It would be an apparition. <clears throat> and the first you know, free, free, the first few apparitions are approved. And after that, you know, they haven't really addressed it. The pilgrimages now, I think as of May of 2019, those have been approved. But as far as being an overall approved um, apparition site, it is not, but it's because it hasn't stopped yet. And that's, that's the deal. You can't make a ruling on an apparition until the apparition ceases. So, you know, we, we hear that Medjugorje is a continuation of Fatima. So if that's the case, they, they do say that Our Lady, you know, when she stops appearing in Medjugorje, she's not going to appear again. So 
it, we're kind of in this zone where it's like, okay, do we follow what, you know, the messages of Medjugorje say, which is, you know, conversion and fast and prayer and the Eucharist and things like that, you know, or do we just disregard it completely, thinking that it's completely false, there's no truth in it whatsoever, and then all of a sudden, here we are in, in these pivotal times, and we're missing these warnings, and then it's too late. So to me, I always like to know a little bit about everything so you can make an informed decision. And, you know, I am, I'm definitely one that does not judge a book by its cover because I know that's, that's foolish. So I'm going to take you back to, I think it was 2010. My brother had died in 2009. I was visiting his grave, and I really felt like he was telling me to go to Medjugorje. And I thought that was just so bizarre because, I mean, it was just random. It's like, really? Like, was that just me or did he really just tell me that? And so I kind of knew that that was the beginning of me finally going to go there one day because that, that desire was just in me like that. And a few days later, my grandma came over and she started talking about Medjugorje. And she said, you know, I think you know, her husband, Rich, I think he is telling me, I think he wants me to take the grandkids to Medjugorje. And I'm just like, really? Because I was just at Dan's grave. And, you know, so we talked about it. And she said, yeah, and I, I would like to pay half of, you know, each person's ticket over there. So very generous offer. Um, so she took, I think there were 16 of us that were of age to go over. And we did. We went over. And I will be honest with you, and I always forget this about Medjugorje, but our, the, the travel there was hell. It took us three days. We were broken up the entire time. We had, some of my cousins were flying to Paris. Some, some were in Germany. Um, I mean, we were all over the place. Engines were breaking down on the runway. We, you know, we'd be sitting there for five hours in the plane almost 100 degrees, people getting sick on the plane. I mean, it was just anything that could have gone wrong, it did. And, you know, my cousin, God bless her, she, she just always offered up, offered up, and we're just thinking like, okay. And so we did. And um, they do say that any pilgrimage you go on, you know, expect warfare. Because anytime you try to grow in your faith, you're going to be met with resistance. That's just That's just how it is. It's all part of the game. And the more you grow in your faith, the more you see that, the more you experience warfare, the easier it becomes because you, you know it's coming, you expect it, and you develop certain things to help you through it. So anyways, so we're over there, and I didn't really know much about what we were going to do. I was trying to keep an open mind. You know, I, I believed that Our Lady was appearing. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to just see what I thought. And so one night I was in bed and I woke up between three and four. I can't really remember what time. And it was just one of those, like I didn't have to go to the bathroom, nothing. I don't know why I, I woke up, but I just did. Like my eyes just opened. And I heard, put your shoes on and go outside. And I'm like, no. And then it came again, and I'm like, I hate the dark. Like, I, I hate the dark. I really do. I'm very scared in the dark. And I just, it would not leave me alone. It was just put your shoes on and go outside. Put your shoes on and go outside. So I got up. I put my shoes on. I grabbed my little flip phone for my light, and I went outside. And when I got out there, I said, okay, now what? And I kid you not, this little dog came running up. And at the time, you know, when Dan died, there were certain things that would always make us think of Dan, and a dog was one of them. And I could really feel my brother's presence at this time. And no, I don't, I don't believe in reincarnation. I don't believe that Dan was any part of this dog at all, but I could feel his presence. And so I just started following this dog. I mean, really, who does that? Like, when I think about that, it's like, was I insane? I don't know. So 10 to 15 minutes, I followed this dog. It was so long to where I thought, oh my gosh, like I'm not going to be able to get back. 
you know, this is a tiny village. There's, there's very little light, you know, a little street light here and there at their little shops, and that's it. And so I just kept going. And the dog stopped all of a sudden. So I looked down to see where the dog was looking to see maybe if, if I could see what it was looking at. And I look down, it's, it's kind of over there, so I'm, I'm looking and I see the Blue Cross. And I have heard of the Blue Cross. The Blue Cross was one of the, I think the place, the first place where Mary appeared in Medjugorje, something like that. I wasn't too sure. It was on the itinerary, but that's all I knew. And I just, I, th I said, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go say a prayer. So I went up and I knelt down and I prayed just to Hail Mary and about halfway through, you know, this, this happened, which is what I'm going to explain to you. Now, real quick, I, I've heard, at that point, I had heard my brother's voice audibly several times. I have, you know, I started hearing in, internally a lot um, from my brother, things like that, but never from Mary or Jesus or anything like that. So I'm here kneeling. And all of a sudden, it is like something just broke open, and I could hear Mary loud and clear in my heart. It was a full, I mean, my eyes were locked on her. She was just speaking to me. And she just said, it was just this, she said, my daughter, I am, be I am begging of you to stop of your destructive behavior. For if you don't, you will never have the time nor the energy to do all in which God is calling you to do. And then she continued to go on and on and on. And I won't get into all of that because it's, you know, it's personal and it, it doesn't matter. But, you know, what, what was my destructive behavior? I will let you know because it, it's, it's insane to me to think that Mary and Jesus and you know, that they can speak to us. It's just, I love it. So at the time, I, you know, when she said this to me, I, I'll, my first thought was, how did you know? Like, I thought I hid it so well. I was a major food addict. Like, I honestly think I could eat anybody under the table. I really do. I would eat a pan of brown, make a pan of brownies and eat them. Um, I would make cookies and eat, I don't even know how many. And one time I even counted up my calories. I was gonna start my diet on Monday morning. And so I stayed up really late Sunday night and I was gonna eat until 12 o'clock midnight because then it would be, you know, Monday. And I consumed 4,035 calories in about a half an hour. I didn't get sick, I could have gotten sick, but I didn't wanna have bulimia. I didn't wanna have like an eating disorder even though I already had one, I just didn't know it. I was a food addict. So, I mean, it was, it was bad. It controlled my life. I would wake up in the morning and I would, I would first thing think, okay, two eggs, that's 150 calories. If I use, I can believe it's, I can't believe it's not butter. That's free. And I mean, just chained. Addictions chain us to sin. That's just what they do. And that's what I was doing. And it, it did. It, it consumed me. I couldn't think of anything other than what I was going to eat and how I was going to get it back off because I would always diet right after. I mean, I'd be up 25, down 25. So any of you struggling with weight, I understand. I do. And I will pray for you. Um, it's a battle. So anyways, after this experience, I just, I could not believe it. And I got back up. You know, all of a sudden I could like, I, I could hear the birds again. I could, I was back. And I don't want to say I fell into a trance or anything like that, but I was, I was focused on Our Lady. And when it was over, I got up and I thought, how am I going to get home? Like, I don't know where I'm at. It was starting to get a little lighter out. And it just so happened that I saw my two cousins that were out looking for my brother who supposedly, I guess he slept on the mountain that night. Um, I guess he was let out to get his healing too. And so I walked back with them and we went to, it's called Cross Mountain and you walk this mountain. And it's not, it's not an easy climb. And 
it was about 11 o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden I could feel my stomach growling like I could hear it and it kind of took me off guard because I'm just like oh okay that's my stomach and then it's like oh my gosh I didn't eat I'm not even hungry like my stomach's growling and I'm not even hungry so for the first time in a long time that void was filled to where I forgot what normal felt like I had struggled for so long and this wasn't just because of Dan you know that alone should have I mean that, that that was extremely difficult but this was from high school days you know I, I was set on playing college sports and I got hurt and it was the end of it and you know typical high school athlete story I feel like you know not a big deal looking back but at the time it was a complete identity crisis and Identity crisis at any age is a big deal. So for the first time, I could feel that void completely filled. And it wasn't by food. So total miracle. Still, to this day, I have never dieted. And in fact, sometimes I I wish that I could just take a pill that was 2,000 calories so I wouldn't have to use my little energy that I have to eat. I mean, it's like night and day difference. So no doubt in my mind did I experience a, a total miracle. And, you know, here and there I do struggle when I'm, I, I can be an emotional eater sometimes, but never to the point that I was and never to the point where I absolutely have to diet before the weekend. I mean, none of that. So the addiction completely gone. And now, you know, to see how my life has kind of played out over the last 10 years it's like now I know what I need my energy for Lord I get it like thank you so just really neat and you know there's there's a movie out now called Apparition Hill and it's about Medjugorje and one of the pilgrims in this movie he was an atheist and he talked to the main visionary which is Mariana is her name and he said, you know, Mariana, as an atheist, where would you tell me to go? If I could go to one place, where would it be? And she kind of laughed and she said, the Blue Cross. She said, go to the Blue Cross, Our Lady will speak to you there. And I was just blown away because that is, that's what happened to me. So, you know, what, what are the chances that, you know what I mean? It's just, It's amazing is what it is. God is amazing. He's still working miracles. He's wanting to work miracles in your life. And he's giving you all of these different portals to get to him. So use them. You know, don't be afraid of that devotion to Mary. Because she's going to help strip you of your worldliness. And we all have it. And she's going to help you rebuild. That's just, it's her role. It's her role in life. And she knows everything is about her son. She, she never once claimed that she was the key to salvation. She knows she's not. She is here to, she's, she's helping us get to heaven. And, you know, she has appeared many places throughout the world. And I'm really excited to get into those prophecies because they need to be known. And, you know, it, it's just, we would be foolish to not heed her warnings. You know, we've been foolish in the past. You know, she predicted wars, and they happened. So, like I said, we'll get into that later. Um, But again, you know, with devotion, if, if you are not growing in your faith and your love for Jesus through a devotion, through any devotion, that's a red flag. You know, with this Medjugorje, I will tell you right now, a lot of people don't believe in Medjugorje. And that's fine. That's totally fine. Because you're not required to believe anything with private revelation or apparitions or anything like that. But, you know, with, with this, this apparition, someone could call me tomorrow and say, Kate, you're not going to believe this, but it's a hoax. I would not care at all. It would not shake me at all. Because I know what I received when I went there. I know the, the miracle that I received there that I was begging for my entire life and didn't receive anywhere else except there. So I believe in that. I've seen conversion. You know, when we were there, it just so happened that Father Pitar, 
he's the main priest that is going to relay these messages to the world. So he's, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of a big deal in Medjugorje. And it just so happened that he was in town one night when we were there on our pilgrimage, and he came out during his two-hour free time period, and he, he talked to our group of 16. You know, he didn't do it for money. He didn't do it for fame. You know, he didn't go to a big stadium full of people. He went to 16 people, and he talked to us about conversion and how conversion is so important because we need to convert now. Tomorrow's even too late. Because when you, when you witness a miracle, it takes time to process that. And then, you know, you may have noticed this too. Whenever you do experience something amazing, you better be prepared to fall pretty hard. You know, it's almost like a spiritual high. And then you got to come down off that mountain and you've got to have enough faith and strength to go through that spiritual lull and come up over the other side. So conversion takes time and it happens over the course of your life. So if you haven't already had a powerful conversion, just continue to place your trust in Jesus. Beg him to to help you. Ask for signs. People think that's a, a sign of weakness. It's not. It's not a sign of weakness. You know, when we ask for signs, we, we better be ready to, to respond to those signs. A lot of people say, you know, oh, God, if you just give me this, then I'll do that. Well, you get whatever it is, but then you don't, you don't hold up your, your end of the bargain. So then you stop receiving signs. That's how it works. You know, I was told one time, Mary said that, you know, this is, this is grace. This is a total gift from God the Father that I am able to communicate to you. The moment you stop relaying my messages... That is the moment I, I will no longer be able to relay the messages to you. So every time I'm tempted to shut my mouth and to just be normal, I hear that in the back of my head. And it's like, I know what it feels like to be disconnected. And I don't ever want to feel like that again. Ever. I mean, it's just when you, when you see what joy feels like, when you see what true conversion feels like, you don't want to go back. And of course, I struggle all the time, all the time. I go through spiritual lulls, probably more than most, because I, I feel like I do have so many spiritual highs. But, you know, I, I heard one time, I can't remember who said it, but they said, you know, Jesus will teach us lessons, and then he'll kind of go away, and that's when we think, Lord, where are you? Why aren't you helping me? That's when he's quizzing us or testing us on the lessons that he taught us. He's kind of standing back. Just think of your, your kids. You know, you teach them something, and they start doing it, and you can see them struggling, but you just, you don't run over. You're not a helicopter parent. You stay back. You kind of see what they're doing, and then you step in when they're about ready to lose it and throw everything everywhere. So God is the same way. You know, as parents, if we just really pay attention to our, our, our family life, you know, what's going on. There's so many lessons that we can learn through our kids. Just like that, what I just explained. You know, so if you're struggling with a certain concept or a certain anything, ask the Lord to relay it to you in a way that you can understand. And I promise you, it will happen. So, again, you know, this devotion... We need to have a devotion to the wonderful, amazing people that God has given us, that Jesus has given us. And we need to use that gift. We do. So for your homework today, I, you know, I was thinking it would be really awesome if you could watch the movie Apparition Hill. It's not free. I don't know, it may, might be $1.99 or something, um, you know, you can look it up. I'll try to include some links on maybe some different places where you can get it. But, I mean, it's a phenomenal movie. And I'm sure many, many, many conversions have come because of it. And if you can't watch the movie, I really encourage you 
to at least think about Mary's role. Think about her role in Jesus' life and think about her in our life. And just whisper a few words to her. You know, pull up a picture of Mary and just talk to her a little bit. So, other than that, I mean, maybe turn on Ave Maria. It's a beautiful song. I'll put it on my little playlist too if you want to look for it there. But Our Lady is wanting to reach us. She's wanting to reach all of us. She's told me that too. You know, my daughter, you are not the only one I'm speaking to. I wish to speak to many souls, but nobody's listening. I don't want to say nobody. I don't think she said nobody. (laughs) Not everyone is listening. She wants to speak to you, and she wants to start healing families. This is the time of the family. Our Lady of Fatima warned us that, you know, the final battle would be on marriage and family, and we're here. We're experiencing that right now. They're trying to break down the traditional family, and they're trying to create their own and make that the new normal. So let's just, let's get our families in check. Let's, you know, pray to the Holy Family, Mary, St. Joseph, Jesus. Let's ask them to instill that hope and encouragement and love and understanding in our own families. Let's do that. Have a good day, guys. Thank you.